Good evening, everybody. It's been one week and two days since more than 61 million people voted for Donald Trump to be our next president. Winning the Electoral College vote with more than 270 votes, as is required, we don't yet know just how many more he will have. Trump's transition to the presidency and his preparation to govern this great nation are well underway. And he's surprised some people. Well, actually, lots of people, particularly today. The Trump team confirming that the president-elect will be meeting with 2012 GOP presidential nominee Mitt Romney. That's right. You may recall Governor Romney did everything that he could to sabotage, to undercut, to destroy and insult Donald Trump's candidacy, saying some of the nastiest, ugliest things uttered by any of the president-elect's one-time opponents and rivals. But Trump has been only magnanimous following his election to become this country's 45th president. Whoever joins the cabinet at least will know they won't be part of the corrupt political establishment that this president-elect ran against. The Trump team announcing today there will be a five-year lobbying ban for anyone who joins his administration. Trump's former campaign manager, Kellyanne Conway, says it's all part of Trump's efforts to make good on his campaign promises. Folks who go into government are not going to be able to enrich themselves by virtue of that position. And that's completely in keeping with why many Americans cast their vote for Donald Trump and Mike Pence. They want someone from the outside. They want someone who goes to Washington owing nobody anything. And we'll be talking about the Trump transition with one of former British Prime Minister David Cameron's closest aides, Steve Hilton. Steve Hilton, an entrepreneur as well. Uh, we'll be talking about really the business of government as well here tonight. Also with me, the five's co-host, Kimberly Guilfoyle, Republican pollster Lee Carter, Republican strategist Tony Sayeg. They join me here in just moments. A lot of developments to cover tonight, including President Obama once again attacking the president-elect while overseas. Speaking at a press conference in Berlin today, Mr. Obama did nothing to end or even calm the left-wing protests that have raged across the country following Donald Trump's election. I've been the subject of protests during the course of my eight years, and I suspect that there's not a president in our history that at some point hasn't been subject to these protests. Um, so I would not advise people who feel strongly or are concerned about some of the issues that have been raised during the course of the campaign. I wouldn't advise them uh, to be silent. He didn't have any advice at all for those who have been violent on the streets of uh, major cities across the country, especially those who are being paid, uh, who are being led by provocateurs, professional provocateurs. But then again, that's President Obama. That's the president, in effect, condoning violence in the streets, particularly the city of Portland. Protests there alone have caused more than a million dollars in damages. Uh, by the way, you may recall that the president-elect told any person who supported him or voted for him to stop it if indeed they were engaging in such behavior. But again, that's our president-elect. Our top story, a busy day for the president-elect as the Japanese prime minister, influential lawmakers, and maybe a name or two uh, to, well, to entertain the frenzied national left-wing media paraded through Trump Tower. Trump himself tweeting this. My transition team, which is working long hours and doing a fantastic job, will be seeing many great candidates today. Hashtag Make America Great Again. Most of those rumored to be in the running for top posts have been Trump loyalists. So it was somewhat surprising to some to learn that Mitt Romney is reportedly being considered for Secretary of State and will be meeting with Donald Trump this weekend. Senator Jeff Sessions, who is on the short list for the cabinet, today said he thought it was positive for Trump and Romney to get together. I think it's good that the president-elect is meeting uh, with people like Mr. Romney. He's meeting with a lot of talented people that are going to be just, he needs good relationships with. I think uh, Mr. Romney will be quite capable of, of doing a number of things. He'll be one of those, I'm sure, that's reviewed. Senator Sessions, whose uh, counsel is always wise, 
And Romney isn't the only former Trump critic and rival uh, being considered for Secretary of State. South Carolina's governor, Nikki Haley, also meeting with the president-elect. That's right, I said Governor Nikki Haley. Uh, joining me now, political communications expert, partner at Maslansky and partners, Lee Carter, and Republican campaign strategist, Fox News contributor, Tony Sag, thank you both for uh, being here. Uh, Lee, I've got to ask you this. I mean, this is very, uh, well, surprising, I think, to most people. But it's, he seems to be rising beyond being uh, president-elect. I mean, this may be a reach for sainthood to bring in Romney and Haley, <laughs> don't you think? I think it's extraordinary. I mean, this 2016 is the year anything can happen, and it has so far. And I am so glad he said in the beginning of his campaign that he was the kind of person that would work with all sides, people who agreed with him, people who disagreed with him. He was going to negotiate. And I think this is just one more example of him bringing people that we know he didn't necessarily, that certainly didn't endorse him, that we know they didn't see eye to eye. But he's willing to hear them out. And I think this is a good sign. I, I, Tony, what do you think? No, no doubt. Look, I think Donald Trump is actually the only person who really knows whether or not any of these names will actually ultimately result in cabinet appointments. Uh, you also have heard Kelly Ayotte, senator from New Hampshire, who's been very critical, mentioned as a potential secretary of defense. You had Ted Cruz, someone who's not necessarily been an outspoken supporter of uh, President-elect Trump, who he met with yesterday. But again, that's a decision Donald Trump needs to make at, at his leisure. The reality is meeting with them publicly sends an important message that this is somebody who from day one is going to be inclusive, build coalitions and get the best ideas forward. And what excites me the most about a Trump presidency, and certainly there's a, a whole kind of array of things to really look forward to, is the fact that this is the only truly businessman to come to the White House with that kind of set of, of experiences and who understands how to get things done and manage these processes in a way that is not only political or not necessarily always viewed through the prism of politics. So that is a very powerful to, to, tool for him. To, to, I don't know that I need to demonstrate to either of you the shallowness of my <laughs> character in nature, but I, I would somehow, I, I think, in, in Donald's place, uh, I, I would probably be construing their their attacks on me while I was a campaign is disqualifying them because they wouldn't have understood how terrific I would have been <laughs> as president of the United <laughs> States. Uh, yet, I, I mean, I, I have to absolutely salute the president-elect for having this kind of capacity, Lee. I, I also have to salute an early, early effort to drain the swamp, as he promised, and that is putting a five-year ban on anyone in his administration before they can lobby the uh, U.S. Uh, well, uh, Congress and the Senate again. I mean, it's really yeah. uh, that that's something, isn't it? It really is something. And I think that one of the things that I love about Donald Trump's communication style, and there are many things, but one of them is that he often punctuates his points with symbolic gestures. So it's not enough for him just to say, I'm going to drain the swamp and I'm going to get special interests out. He actually is putting actions behind it. And this is just a very, very good example, a five-year ban unheard of. And it does show that anybody who's going to go and work in that administration is doing it for the best interests of this country. And I think it's fantastic. His, his election was clearly a rebuke of a system in Washington that just doesn't work and serve the people. And the reality, unfortunately, is both parties have something to do with it. Lobbyists who argue for only their parochial special interests have a lot to do with it. So this is a great gesture, as is, by the way, his call for term limits that just today received a fairly warm welcome on Capitol Hill from Speaker Ryan. Not necessarily a group of people you would think would embrace the idea of term limits, and that's because people know he means business. This is not somebody whose words are considered hollow rhetoric. They're really considered impactful, and that's why I think he's going to be very successful in the early term for sure. Yeah, I, I, uh, I may point out, Paul Ryan, well beyond what would be considered a reasonable term limit uh, range, but uh, I, I did my best to constrain myself when hearing the speaker's <laughs> name. I, th another important, I think, uh, issue here is certainly, uh, in, and again, bringing up Paul Ryan, uh, stopping a, a vote on restoring earmarks, which have been uh, uh, have been pushed away from Congress for now five years, uh, they're all licking their chops, wanting to bring back those uh, those earmarks. Uh, do you think that uh, that they're going to be able to hold the line? That is, the president elect uh, dealing with the the leadership of both the Senate and the Congress. 
No, I'm certainly encouraged by Paul Ryan's behavior on this. It seems to me that he's showing that he understands what the American people have said and why the Republicans are back in the White no, he House. Stopped, he are, stopped it. And, but exactly. Do you think he's going to be able to hold the, that, the, that the president-elect, the Republican leadership, are going to be able to hold the line? I believe they could, yeah. I'm very optimistic right now. I believe that anything can happen based on what we've seen over the last two weeks. So I do believe that they can. <laughs> you, <laughs> you've had a hallelujah experience, certainly. <laughs> and and I, I also want to give Donald Trump the credit for putting Mike Pence in charge of a lot of these processes, the transition for certain, and the liaisoning with Capitol Hill. We saw a very constructive result today. When do you, you had, think he's going to be able to hold the line? Absol on absolutely. Absolutely. And I even now, will now further I say... Donald Trump is setting the agenda in Washington. That's the bottom line. Well, that's a great place to, to, uh, to leave it until we continue further, and we will, guaranteed. Lee, thank you so much, Tony. Thank you so much. We great appreciate it. Thank We're you. coming right back. We've got a lot, lot more. Stay with us. A rising number of left-wing mayors in sanctuary cities across the country pledging to fight both the law and the president-elect. Eleven cities now, from Los Angeles to New York, vowing not to cooperate with the Trump administration on deportation orders for illegal immigrants, preserving their sanctuary status. There are more than 200 of these sanctuary cities and jurisdictions all across the country, all told about 400 jurisdictions that have policies, police department orders, or non-binding resolutions of some kind that limit local officials from cooperation with federal immigration law enforcement, ignoring federal law. Now, Trump has threatened to cut off federal aid to these sanctuary cities, and he has a lot of leverage to do so. Those sanctuary cities receive some $650 billion from the federal government. That's what they call leverage. Joining me now, the co-host of The Five, Kimberly Guilfoyle, uh, attorney and uh, an absolutely perfect to talk about the issue of sanctuary yes, cities. Yes, you're right. Because all levels of law are involved. You're absolutely right. And also because I was a prosecutor assistant district attorney in San Francisco, which is one of the premier uh, violators in terms of being a sanctuary city and for all intents and purposes, they are going to, going to continue oh, to course. do so. And now you see a lot of people being very vocal, some of the different mayors across this country defiant. saying that, defiant right. that they will flat out disregard the rule of well, law in favor of their political ideology. Help me out on something, because I listen to some of the people for whom I have uh, very low regard on any level uh, who run these cities, uh, in, in particularly Rahm Emanuel in Chicago. Oh. A violent uh, crime wave just. Well, he should be recalled just based on the, the loss uh, of lives there. It's saying to people he's going to, you know, preserve Chicago as a sanctuary city no matter the law, no matter what. And I'm sorry, didn't this administration just use federal supremacy clause mm -hmm. law to insist upon? getting done whatever it wanted to on this issue mm -hmm. why should it not uh, why should it not apply in the issue of sanctuary cities straight out oh it it should apply i mean it is applicable it should apply but the problem is you have people putting forward their own ideology and their viewpoints and trying to put forward these sanctuary cities by the way at great cost to public safety to people who are here legally or citizens who deserve a right to be protected and have the rule of law Followed. But instead, you have these people, these miscreants across the country, going ahead and thumbing their nose at the law. If you're not going to follow the law and the rules of the land, then don't be in the position. And, and, and to be clear, what Donald Trump has said, his administration yeah. will be going after criminal, illegal immigrants. Correct. The estimate is two to three million of them. And on that basis, they make up a considerable uh, portion of violent crime in this country, the MS-13, various gangs. Absolutely. And yeah, all the all the, the gangs that come across and they recruit What's here, it going to take to terrible. do it? You know, it's going to really take a, a firm hand. And I believe that President-elect Donald Trump will do it because this is something he was very passionate about. He talked about putting forward Kate's Law uh, right. based on the, the homicide of Kate Steinle that happened in San Francisco. If that person, if the rule of law was followed, Kate Steinle would be alive today. And that's also, a, um, you know, the law that Bill O'Reilly was pushing so hard as well. Yeah. I think that uh, Trump will so. put that in. Yeah, yeah, and he can use also executive action to put that forward. Now, he is about, the president-elect, 
to reverse a substantial number of the executive mm -hmm. actions and orders mm -hmm. on the part of President Obama. Uh, is that going to work in most cases mm -hmm. with those executive orders? Yes, I think it will. I think um, it will work in with respect to, um, you know, because President Obama came out about the Dreamers and asking and people are pushing President Obama to pardon 750,000. That's not going to work because even if he pardons them, it doesn't make them legal or citizens. So that's an issue right there. So some of that can be undone by uh, President-elect Donald Trump. Also about um, transgender, the bathrooms. That can be uh, undone. And then um, there's like one other one that maybe I think that he can do pretty quickly. So, I mean, I think you'll see it happen, to be honest. And very quickly, Mitt Romney mm -hmm. coming in to talk with the president elect. Uh, I have just confessed my. What a somewhat, turnabout. <laughs> my, my petty nature in these things is viciously as Mitt Romney attacked Donald Trump's candidacy. I, I, and he was in a very powerful position to. Uh, exert some influence on behalf of the Republican Party to bring everybody together, sure. and instead he, he went, went out, out this, of his this, way. Uh, what's his name? Evan. Uh, <sighs> yeah, the guy what? in what's his name? In McMullen. McMillan or something yeah, in, in that, yeah, Utah. So I, that that's I mean, a problem. So, but you know what? It just goes to show how magnanimous yeah. President Donald uh, Trump, uh, elect Donald oh, Trump, is going to be, and he's actually reaching across the lines to try to make yeah. things work. I, in his transition to this point, if I say so myself, I mean, he has been extraordinary. And at the same time, the national left-wing media continue, New York Times, Washington Post continue their carping and attacks. Uh, it's some of the, I thought they were ignorant during the campaign. Sure. They've risen to a level of ignorance and abhorrence of the basic precepts of journalism that I never imagined they could reach even two weeks ago. Oh, it's, it's unbelievable. Appalling. It really is. But you know what? Um, America will be the beneficiary of great decision making and honest leadership with President elect Donald Trump. And we have just learned that uh, General Michael Flynn has uh, been offered uh, the job of national security advisor uh, in the Trump White House. There Kimberly, you go. All right, great excellent. to see you. And great so you it then. begins. Yes, yeah, so it begins. <laughs> or, or continues. <laughs> Thanks so much. Be sure to vote in our poll tonight. Do you believe the left wing national media will give ever Donald Trump due credit for reaching out so graciously, magnanimously to both Romney and Governor Haley? Cast your vote on Twitter at Lou Dobbs. We'd like to hear from you. Follow me on Twitter at Lou Dobbs. Like me on Facebook. Follow me on Instagram. At Lou Dobbs tonight on Wall Street, stocks closing near record highs. The Dow regaining 36 points on the day. The S&P up 10, the Nasdaq up 39. Volume on the big board, well, again, moderate trading, 3.8 billion shares. And incredible economic news, housing starts surging to a nine-year high, up 25.5% last month because of a spike primarily in multifamily construction. Wells Fargo's fraudulent account scandal taking a toll on the bank in which 5,000 employees lost their jobs, including the job of the CEO. New account openings plummeted there 44% last month from a year ago. And Fed Chair Janet Yellen testifying that the Fed could hike interest rates, as she put it, relatively soon. We've been hearing that since last December 16th of 2015. The Fed Chair also adding she's not going anywhere. I was... Um, confirmed by the Senate to a uh, four-year term, which ends at the end of January of 2018, and it is fully my intention to serve at that term. And a reminder to listen to my reports three times a day, coast to coast on the Salem Radio Network. Up next, Donald Trump riding an anti-establishment wave to the White House, thanks in part to this battle cry. I want the entire corrupt Washington establishment to hear the words we all are about to see. When we win on November 8th, we are going to Washington and we will drain the swamp. Drain the swamp. Trump is making sure he fulfills that promise. That's the subject of my commentary here next. Stay with us. We'll be right back with much, much more. A few thoughts now on draining the swamp. We're just over a week into the Trump transition, and the president-elect is working hard to assemble his team, and he's also working hard to deliver on his campaign promises already. 
His vice president-elect, Governor Mike Pence, already removing lobbyists from the presidential transition team. Speaker Ryan yesterday suddenly put a halt to an effort in the House to bring back earmarks. He sent the promises of the Trump anti-establishment victory. And now the Trump team taking another huge step to drain the swamp. The president-elect requiring a five-year lobbying ban for all appointees to his administration. That is a very big deal. Last year, lobbyists spent more than $3 billion, $3.2 billion, just to influence Congress and federal agency, an average of about $6 million per lawmaker. That money, one of the reasons Washington is flooded with graft and corruption, as the revolving doors between public service and private business are filled with elected officials, lobbyists, and a lot of lubrication. Money, money, money. Under the Trump presidency, those same registered lobbyists will not be allowed to serve in his administration, nor will they be able to use government to enrich themselves within five years of leaving the Trump administration. Kellyanne Conway touted the move in an interview today. Nobody got rich off of the Donald Trump campaign. And it's just in keeping with the way he would like to run his government and all of its organs and adjuncts. Why do we need this revolving door of lobbyists and consultants? Why do we need 10 people to say the same thing? We just don't. Mr. Trump is just meeting the demands and the desires of the American electorate by trying to drain the swamp. Drain the swamp. There's music in those words, don't you think? Well, Mr. Trump has already taken big steps, huge steps, and set an important public integrity standard for his administration. He set precedent in delivering early on his promise to drain the swamp, very early. The swamp that is D.C. is now already on notice, and there remain 63 days before he takes his oath of office. How many elected officials begin keeping their campaign promises long before they're in office? The answer is all the great ones. Now our quotation of the evening. This one from a fellow by the name of Donald Trump who said this, I judge people based on their capability, honesty, and merit. And there you have it. No wonder there's so much anxiety in the left-wing media and in Washington, D.C. these days. We're coming right back. Stay with us. The left-wing national media publishing pure propaganda, bogus claims that Trump's transition is in disarray. Kellyanne Conway says it's all running smoothly and all on time. The president-elect has slid into this role amazingly well. We're right on track, right on time. What can the Trump team do about all of these lies being pushed by the left-wing national media? We'll take it up with one of former Prime Minister David Cameron's top aides, Steve Hilton joins me here next. More breaking news on the, uh, the latest development uh, from the Trump transition team. Uh, the Associated Press reporting that the Trump campaign has offered uh, retired Lieutenant General Michael Flynn the job of National Security Advisor to, to uh, what will soon be uh, President Donald Trump. That according to a senior official in the Trump campaign. General Flynn is a self-described maverick and longtime Democrat who remained a steadfast ally of the uh, president-elect throughout the campaign. The National Security Advisor does not, by the way, require Senate confirmation. Joining me now is Steve Hilton. He served as an advisor to the former British Prime Minister David Cameron, an advocate for Britain leaving the EU. He is currently the CEO of CrowdPAC, a Silicon Valley political crowdfunding and data site entrepreneur and bright fellow. Good to have you here. Great to be here, Lou. Uh, first, your reaction to Donald Trump taking these early steps, uh, whether it be five years before you can lobby uh, our, our, our government again, uh, serving in his administration, whether it be earmarks. Uh, I mean, he's taking early steps to yeah. deliver on his promise to drain the swamp. I love to say that, if you haven't <laughs> noticed, folks. Drain the swamp. It's exactly as you just said. It's so refreshing to see a politician actually do what they say they're going to do. And it's ridiculous that we should find that surprising and refreshing, but that's the sorry state of our politics. Now, that's exactly what people elected him to do, to go and shake things up. Right. And I think all the indications that you're getting from the way he's going about this, the appointment he's making, appointments he's making, is that he's serious about shaking things up. 
And that's great because it needs shaking up. Does it ever? And, uh, and the popularity of this man uh, is, is a result of speaking truth uh, yes. to, the, to the people. They, they hadn't heard it for so long over the course of this campaign that for the first time in my professional career, I, I wasn't tired of this campaign by the time it concluded, a year and a half of this. Most people are saying, oh, please, just get it over. A few did, but most of them were on the losing side of it, and you can understand their urgency. But it, it's, it's really a, you can sense the change that is profound, that's in the air. Yeah. Uh, and there is a building anticipation for the moment that Donald Trump walks into the yeah. White House. And I think he understands that. And I think that it's not just that... Um, he, 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 he was interesting in the way that he put out his arguments. He also did it in plain English. Mm -hmm. He spoke simply and clearly. And I think that relates to something that we're seeing going on right now with the way that this transition and his first few days are being covered by the media, which is completely ridiculous. They have always underestimated him precisely because he speaks plainly in simple terms that average Americans can understand instead of the highfalutin language yeah. that hides the truth that we're so used to from politicians. Well, speaking of obfuscation, uh, President Obama in, in Berlin today, uh, in Germany, talking about uh, God knows what besides himself. Again, you know, he's a tremendous fan of the first person singular. He, he can never let it go. He, he keeps Angela Merkel uh, the Chancellor of Germany waiting as he finishes a thought that is, uh, you know, 15 minutes in duration that has about five minutes of content and about a minute yes. of it worth listening to. You know what, that press conference, and in fact, all the things he said on this farewell tour um, of, of overseas countries, it just really reminds me of the most infuriating version of Obama, which is the version of Obama that is the snooty anthropology professor, yeah. not a leader yeah. actually shaping events, making decisions that change things, but someone from on high observing. And, and that is, I think, at the heart of what we've seen, because it's the policy failures of that attitude that have resulted in Donald Trump's election. Absolutely. And the desperate need for him to get into That's that right. Oval Office. Uh, it, Obama gives you the sense that he is going to bring his, his uh, fingers with snuff attached That's right. uh, for a, a quick uh, snort. But, I, I mean, he, he really is all of the worst of what uh, you think of when you think of an elitist. Uh, exactly. Vacuous, uh, self-important, and uh, well, staying well beyond is welcome. But what's really interesting about it is because he puts it in language that is so cerebral. The, the and what, suffocating. The, the press are so gullible uh -huh. and superficial and sycophantic, frankly, that they, don't interpret, like them either, that, well, they interpret it as great wisdom. Yeah. But actually, right. all it's doing is hiding the, the real-life failure what is your, of his policies. I, I couldn't agree with you more. What, what is your advice to the Trump, uh, I was about to say campaign, the, the Trump administration, uh, the team now, on how to deal with a, a, an absolutely vicious, venal, often vapid, uh, but certainly nasty left-wing national media that doesn't give a damn what the facts are. They're going to attack yeah. him uh, and uh, all of his, uh, his administration. Well, you could just see it. I mean, the New York Times is, is, is probably the worst. They've made fools of themselves, I think, in the last week. If you just go back a right. couple of days, the end of last week, the front-page story lambasting Trump for having lobbyists in the transition team. Right. He brings in Pence, he dumps the lobbyists, and then it's a front-page story about chaos and turmoil. Right. They are really revealing their prejudice. And I, I want to put up, see, very quickly, we're, I know we're short on time, but I want to show this graphic to just so everyone understands. This is, these are the appointments by uh, administration in weeks. Uh, as you see there, whether it's Nixon, Carter, Reagan, uh, an exception mm. is uh, Bush 41, uh, then uh, Clinton, uh, Bush 43, Obama. Nothing happened in the first two weeks. Where That's we right. Have in. We have seen countless stories by the left-wing national media, whether it's the Washington Post, whether it is the New York Times, as you suggest, the typical scoundrels at uh, NBC, ABC, CBS, lambasting Donald yes. Trump and his transition. It's just hysterical. I, it's truly embarrassing for them. And I think I'm right in saying that with Clinton, first right. time around in 92, months into the administration, there's still thousands of positions right. unfilled. 
Yeah, and the truth is, though, too, Clinton did something very bright. He had a, uh, a, uh, a president-elect's conference uh, uh, on, on the economy. It was an absolute tremendous success. He's the only president I've ever seen do it. It was brilliant. Uh, and I think worthwhile for, for yeah, what but it's what's real, what, what's really going to make the difference is the action that this administration takes. Well, I firmly believe that you're going to see a huge resurgence of enterprise and dynamism in our economy. I think it's already uh, underway, uh, and I think it's reflected in the markets. I think it's reflected in the actions he's taken. I think you're right. That's the short answer. <laughs> Steve Hilton, good to have you here. Thanks for being Be with here. you, Lou. Appreciate it. Joining me now, the Vice President of Business and Culture for the Media Research Center, Dan Gaynor. Dan, good to have you with us. Uh, an extraordinary report talking about uh, the absolutely disastrous uh, coverage uh, on the part of the national left-wing media. I mean, it, it, I want to put this up uh, as we talk, and you can explain what we're looking at. But this is the comparison between the coverage of Steve Bannon and the vicious attacks by the left-wing media and Keith Ellison, the congressman uh, from Minnesota, who is uh, Muslim, who is a, a radical activist uh, and wants to be the head of the DNC. Uh, how could it be that disproportionate? Well, what they're trying to do is not just double down on what they did during the campaign. They're trying to take down Trump's nominees. If they can defeat his nominees, they think they'll defeat his administration. So they full full bore almost 20 times attacks on Bannon, uh, you know, versus uh, you know, a little over two minutes uh, on Ellison and nothing negative in the, the bit of Ellison. And Ellison's got a hefty bag of controversies, uh, attacks on Israel, uh, ties to the Muslim Brotherhood, which means, you know, through that, you ultimately you're linked back to Hamas. You've got, uh, you know, the, the whole idea of he gave out this quote linking 9-11 to the Reichstag fire. If that doesn't sound like 9-11 trutherism, I don't know what else it is. Yeah, and uh, everyone wanted, of course, to give him a pass because that suits the narrative of the national left-wing media. It's who they are. The New York Times, Donald Trump has been hitting back, and, and, and he's a tough guy. And very few people in his position as the nominee of the party could, I think, have been uh, quite as persuasive because he, I mean, he absolutely didn't put up with their nonsense for a minute. Uh, and I think that that should be a lesson to every candidate running for office. When you're dealing with lying skunks, you don't need to get near the smell, right? Well, and also he's doing something that the media don't like. He's using Twitter exactly the same way that FDR used radio. He's what what the tech people would say, disintermediating the media. He's yeah. just removed them from the equation. He can go right to the right to the voters, right to his audience and say, here's what's really going on. And that that's what FDR did with the original radio broadcast. Is this going to persist? Of its Is this time. going to persist, Dan? We're going to have to go. I, but well, certainly the media judgment. attacks are going to. So, that's what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, so he's, so he's got to. So he's, he's going he's to got have to, it's the he's way he's have to be very back. tough with them. Right? Yeah, they, he's going to take them to the woodshed. Okay, or, or whatever. Dan, thanks so much. Dan Gaynor, we appreciate it. Up next, thanks. Donald Trump today meeting with the best, of, the best and the brightest. And folks close to the process say things are going smoothly. These are people at the top of their game that want to buy into this vision of making this country great. It's been unbelievable. It's fast-paced. Things are getting done. Things are moving forward uh, to make sure that this administration is ready on day one. In case you didn't know, that was Sean Spicer of the RNC. Ebony Williams, Chris Plant, join me here next. Stay with us. Joining me now, the host of The Chris Plant Show on WMAL, Chris Plant, and attorney Fox News contributor Ebony Williams. Thank you both for being here. We've got a lot to cover. Uh, let's turn to sanctuary cities. Yes. It looks like there is a way to go here. You're the attorney. I am. It looks like Trump has a lot of firepower behind him, no matter what Rahm Emanuel or the mayors of Los Angeles, New York, or wherever say. Let's talk real candid here tonight, gentlemen. Uh, Trump has all the tools behind him because guess what? Just like President Obama told the state of Arizona a few years back, 
you do not get to make statewide immigration policy. You don't get to do that. The United States Constitution, the Supremacy Clause, specify that the federal law on this issue is supreme and it must be followed. All Rahm Emanuel and de Blasio and all these sanctuary city guys are doing, they're creating a fake narrative that makes them look like heroes around this, this issue to illegals. They're pandering they, they, to That's what it is. Standard. But they're talking about a bunch of nothing because all they really are doing is, is saying something that they can't do. And you know the crazy thing to me, Chris, is he... Donald Trump is talking about criminal illegal immigrants. Yes. And these right. these mayors, for whatever reason, think they can successfully pander by supporting illegal immigrants and protecting them from consequences of being right. criminals. Right. And you mentioned Rahm Emanuel in Chicago. Rahm Emanuel and I were high school classmates, believe it or mm. not. And uh, <laughs> he is, uh, this is the same guy that said that Chick-fil-A and Chick-fil-A values have no place in yeah, Chicago, yeah. but he's protecting criminal illegal aliens. And let me go one step further, if I could. In addition to the funds issue, and uh, uh, brilliant, absolutely right, using Obama administration techniques against them is absolutely appropriate. I believe that they should also raise the specter with these mayors that they will face criminal charges of accessory to crimes. If you have a Kate Steinle situation mm -hmm. and a murderer that has right. been released back onto the street because of their policies, somebody killed kill somebody or, or some other horrendous crime, these politicians should be held responsible yeah, and I, they should be charged as accessories to the crime. I want to speak on that. Very good point. Another way to do that uh, from a lit litigation standpoint, if your family member 